Okay, let's read the Word of God together this morning. The Word of God is from Genesis chapter 11, verses 31 to 12, verse 9. So these are <clears throat> about uh, 11 verses. Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, all the way to chapter 12, verse 9. Let's read these verses responsively and uh, picture the story in your mind as you read God's Word. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. Let's read responsively. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan, when they came to the land of Canaan. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And together, and Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Amen. This is the word of God. I want to introduce a Korean saying. I don't really talk about Korean terms that much in our English service, but I want to make, uh, mention this saying, so we know, others don't, of uh, the pumpkin. Pumpkin has rolled into your bosom. A pumpkin has rolled. A big pumpkin has rolled into your bosom. So where would do we get that phrase? What is the origin of that phrase? We say that a lot when we talk about blessing. We are in the blessing series and this is our last Sunday on talking about blessing. But where do we get that phrase? A uh, pumpkin comes into uh, somebody's possession. Well, there's some research on the internet and uh, there are many candidates, many stories attached to it, but one of them was very conceiving, very um, persuasive. Uh, it's uh, in the province of Gyeongnam. Uh, they have the tradition of the wife, the, uh, the bride, uh, coming to the in-laws family uh, to be wed, right? And she would come in this, this kama, this, you know, carriage uh, led by servants. And in the carriage, there would be the, the bride uh, who's to be wed. And also in there was this pumpkin, this big old pumpkin. And uh, when they arrive at the house of the in-law, before she gets off and goes into the living room, the servant would bring the pumpkin and roll it to the mother-in-law. And she would embrace it. And she would say, The pumpkin, this big pumpkin has fell to my lap. And that's like a saying of blessing. It is uh, a, a symbolism of saying that a, a precious person has become a family member. This bride is such a blessing to our family. Because you might think pumpkin is, you know, what's the big deal with pumpkin? 
squash, what's the big deal? But in, in those days, like old days, uh, you know, food was scarce and, you know, you eat everything. And so pumpkin, there's so many things to eat in a pumpkin that you can eat the seed, the leaf, you make panchan out of the leaf, <laughs> and you eat the squash, the pumpkin itself. So there's nothing to throw away. It was such a precious uh, vegetable. And just a big pumpkin would have been such a blessing to the family. So there, she's liking it, the, 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 the bride to this pumpkin who uh, it's a blessing. There's nothing to throw away. She is, uh, has come into this house uh, by coincidence and such a, you know, it's a, a blessing to the family. And we get this expression, uh, the pumpkin has fallen into a bosom. We want something great to happen in our lives. We find people buying lottery tickets, being of the year, or maybe every month. We find people who go to fortune teller, fortune readers, to find out what's in there for, for their life this year or their day. We, uh, you know, see people reading their horoscopes. People want, they want something good, something fortune, some kind of fortune to happen in their lives. Those who are doing business, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, would want to you know, hit it big this year and get a lot of money, earn a lot of money, uh, maybe go IPO, um, you know, they want this blessing. And if you are in a, working at a workplace as an employee, you want to get a raise, you want to uh, advance in your position, you want something good to happen to you. For the students, it could be uh, getting into a prestigious school this year, uh, if you're a senior and you're aiming to go to college. That could be a blessing for you. But is blessing something that happens to roll in your lap, like the pumpkin? Is the Christian blessing that we seek after, is it something that just happens by chance? We've been talking about the past couple of weeks, what blessing is, blessing of God is. God is the fount of blessing. We said blessing was the favor of God. And blessing is a life, a fellowship with Jesus Christ. So as we looked at the Sermon on the Mount series, especially the Beatitudes, those who weep can be comforted because there is Jesus. Those who are hungry and, and thirsty for righteousness will be satisfied because there is Jesus. And uh, we can be poor, yet receive the kingdom of God, heaven, because we have Jesus. God is the fount of blessing, and fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, is blessing itself. Therefore, we do not follow and chase after blessing, but those who are followers of Christ Blessing follows them. And I'm remind, remind of, uh, reminded of Psalms uh, 23, David's Psalm, the last verse. Let's read together, in fact, what this says. Uh, 23, 6, ready, go. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It says God's favor, oh, can you show us the verse again? God's favor, goodness and kindness, mercy shall follow me not just one day, but all the days of our lives, as long as we live on this earth. Why? Because we possess, we dwell, we cohabit with the fount of all blessing, God himself. That was the prayer of David. This morning, uh, I want to share this message from Genesis chapter 11 and 12 about the founder, who the uh, fount of blessing upon this earth, the first person that God blessed, truly blessed on this earth. What is the life which blessings follow is the question I want to ask this morning. What is, what kind of life is a life that blessings follow after? Not we pursuing blessing, but blessing follow us. What is that kind of life? How can we live that kind of life? We look at the Bible to find the answer. This message is from my quiet time notes this past week, in fact. So reading my Bible, I was so blessed. Uh, jot down some more notes and uh, turn it into a sermon uh, and believe God wants to, he wants to tell us about receiving God's blessing in our life this year. What is the life which blessings follow? Uh, it's in twofold. First is obey Him in daily life. The key point is daily life. Can we say it together? Obey Him in daily life. If you've been reading through the uh, Bible uh, this year in Genesis, according to the schedule in your bulletin, 
you've been reading chapter 11 and 12 and 13. Uh, in chapter 11, we find the genealogy of Shem. Who is Shem? Shem was one of the sons of Noah, right? Shem, uh, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, Shem was one of the sons of Noah after the flood. And God commanded Noah and his sons to flourish, to reproduce, and fill the earth. But uh, they kind of got stuck in the way, right? They stopped at Babel and built this tower, this arrogant sin against God, wanted to be like God, and God scattered them. And Shem and his descendants began to scatter all over the earth. And chapter 11, the, the chapter we just read, focuses on the genealogy of Shem. So we see uh, Shem fathered, was the father of who, and who, who gave birth to who, who. It's a long genealogy of the genealogy of Shem. And if you can imagine, this, these people who were scattered, what would their occupation naturally be? Their mission was to scatter. Their was, mission was to fill the earth. And what kind of job can you have? You can't be a farmer, right? You can't wait around a year or two to receive the crop and live because you have to move on. So naturally, from the Bible, we find many hints that they were nomads. They were in the sheep and goat business industry, right? Raising cattle. They were nomads. They were traveling from here to there looking for good pasture to feed their, their stock and to, to water them, right? And so you can imagine them moving from one place to another. And we come to the end of the genealogy of Shem. Uh, noted uh, genealogy here. His name is, is uh, Terah that we just read this morning in verse 11, 31. Terah had three sons, right? And they were Abraham and Haran and also Nahor. And we focus on Abraham, Abram in chapter 12. But before we get to chapter 12, we want to look a little bit at uh, Terah's life. You know, he, like the other Shemites, he was a nomad and he was looking for precious pasture grass to feed his livestock. And uh, we read in verse 31, that uh, Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, uh, his grandson and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son, son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. It's a long sentence. But uh, they were originally living in, after they scattered, they were living in Ur of the Chaldeans or Chaldeans. This is modern-day Babel, uh, not modern-day, Biblical times Babel, uh, Babylon, the city of Babylon. And uh, maybe, we don't know why they wanted to move, why um, Terah wanted to move to Canaan. But we can assume that they were looking, always looking for pasture, for grass, for wells and water. And so they wanted to move to a uh, flourishing, you know, grain pasture land, which they heard was in Canaan. So they were headed that direction, but they settled in Haran because his dad passed away. Terah passed away. So up to this point, there's nothing extraordinary. Just a normal day life. Actually, you know, uh, Terah lived over 200 years, so he had a good life. And there's nothing special about Abram. No reason for God to bless. But everything changes in verse 1 of chapter 12, when God starts to intervene in Abram's life. And this is what happens. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. What happened? God showed up. This is something amazing. You might think, oh, you've read this so many times that it doesn't really hit you that much. But imagine when Abram first heard God's voice speaking to him. It was just, a, a, you know, his life-changing moment. Because the last time we heard God speak to an individual was when he spoke to Noah and his sons. He blessed them. Go, flourish the earth. And after many, many, many generations, tens of generations, he finally speaks to an individual called Abram. And so no, Abram had heard about this God as a legend maybe a long time ago. But to hear his voice, he was honored. He was privileged. He was astonished to hear the voice of God. And what was the content of the Word of God? In verse 2 and 3 of the same chapter, God says, I will make you great into a great nation. So first blessing was that he would become big, 
a big family, a famous family of many nations. The second blessing was that whoever blesses you, they will be blessed. Whoever curses you, you, they will be cursed. You will be like the channel of blessing. You will be the fountainhead of all, blessing all the other people on this earth. So not only will he be a blessing, but he will be a blessing to others as well. He got this amazing word, promise from God. And he was excited until he heard the condition. Right, Verse 1. To get the condition. Going back to the first verse. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country to the lands that I will show you. Okay, God, I want to receive this blessing. I want that big pumpkin to roll in my lap. But the challenge is to where? I want to obey. I want to go. But where do you want me to go? If I was uh, Abram, I would be very frustrated. Right? you got to tell us where to leap, you know. If you're telling me to relocate, you want to first know where so you could calculate how the expenses and how long it'll take and what kind of sacrifice you have to make. Now, Abram wanted, he was humble, he wanted to obey, but uh, he was frustrated. You know, when, maybe you have a similar experience when, you know, our family does a car trip, right, to like L.A. or, you know, a little bit distance. There are unexpected stops, and uh, I would ask my wife, I'm driving, and I would ask her, hey, could you find a nearby restaurant because it's lunchtime? Could you find a gas station to make a stop for gas or a restroom break? And she would search it up right on the pathway. We didn't plan this ahead. Why, well, you can't. And so she would search it up, and she finds find something, and she would turn on her phone and, and navigate there, and she would tell me which direction to go. Oh, make an exit right here after two miles. And then right with, I'm just going straight and right at the turn, she tells me, make a left turn, I'm on the right lane. It's hard to get to the left turn. So I'll tell her, tell me ahead of time a little bit. It's 50 feet ahead, 100 feet ahead, a mile ahead. If you tell me, it would be help, helpful to me a lot. But she doesn't, right? She just tells me at the last minute and it's frustrating. Our voices go up and we don't have a very pleasant lunch afterwards. See, some of you are nodding and smiling. Maybe you can sympathize <laughs> with that. I just take away the GPS. I'll just do it. Maybe Abraham was frustrated like that. You know, God said, just go. I will tell you where to go. But where, God? I have this big family, and I have a, you know, I'm just going to have to trust you. This was, was frustrating. And maybe he was, he could have been angry. Aren't we also frustrated sometimes when we do our quiet time reading the Bible and God tells you to obey. God tells you to live a holy life. God tells you to focus on Jesus Christ, the founder of our faith. But how? How can I obey? Where, what do I obey? What does he want me to do? Sometimes we get frustrated on what this means and how to live this life of, of obedience. We want the blessing, but how? I had a little bit of frustration this week as I was reading uh, chapter 10 and chapter 11. All these names, right? If you look at the, our, our bulletin, it was just one day was just all names. So Shem became the father of our our Pekshed, and our Pekshed was the father of Shelah. Shelah was the father of Eber, and you know all and it goes on and on, and that's the end. God, I want to obey this word, but how should I obey this word? Am I supposed to father somebody? I'm, you know, I'm done with kids. What to, how should I obey this? Well, we get frustrated. What does God want us to obey as we hear his word? Well, let's look a little bit closer at what Abram did. Maybe we can get some clues here to live that life of blessing. Follow us, following us. What did Abram do? In verse 5, let's look at verse 5 of chapter 12. It says, And Abram took Sarai, his wife, Lot, his brother, uh, son, and all their possession, gathered the people they, that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan when they came to the land of Canaan, blah, blah, blah. Did Abram just uh, go out and go wherever his, his uh, you know, footsteps led him? According to this verse, um, we're kind of lost here. <laughs> According to this verse, Abraham had a destination. He was set on going to the land of Canaan. And it, said, it, it emphasized one more time that he did arrive at his destination, which was Canaan. 
We want to go back to our, the previous verses. Did we miss something? God said, go and I'll show you. And he just went to Canaan. Did we miss something? What's going on? How did Abraham know what to obey, how to obey, where to go, uh, according to God's word? I struggled with this a little bit during my quiet time this past week. And what, what caught my attention was the first verse that we read this morning in 31 of chapter 11. Roll back, please. And we find the word Canaan here in Terah's plans. Terah is the father of Abram. And we find, we know from the book of Acts that Terah was no God-fearer. He was an auto worshiper in the land of Ur. Right? And uh, he wanted to go to the land of Canaan. What's going on? I thought Canaan was the holy land and Terah's not holy. So why would he want to go to Canaan? The only hint we can find from the context of this word is that what was their occupation? They were nomads. They were razor, razor of, of cattle and sheep and goat. And so they were constantly looking for green grass, water. And they heard Canaan was a luscious land flowing with you know, milk and honey later, but also with water and, and grass and a lot of land. So Terah made the logical decision to live on and continue his livelihood in the land of Canaan, but he happened to die in Haran. So when Abram heard from God, go, the first place that came to his mind was guess where? Canaan. It was not a divine revelation. God did not tell him to go to Canaan. But it was so natural for him. In his daily life, he knew what to do because he knew that God had seen his entire life and God has led him so far in this direction. And when God says, go, leave Haran, he left Haran to go to Canaan. We find a very important lesson here that God speaks to us in our daily lives. In everyday lives, mundane, just everyday lives, he speaks to us and he uses those lively situations for his will. Most cases, I would say most cases, God leads us in the direction that he has been leading for uh, the rest of the pre our previous lives. It's very rare when he makes us make, make that U-turn or make that detour. It's very rare. Uh, maybe like when Paul was, uh, had this vision uh, he wanted to go stay in Asia and preach the gospel in Asia, but God gave him a specific vision to go over to Europe. That's a exception, right? But normally God has a direction that he has been leading us, and he continues to lead us to that direction. The important thing is for God, for important thing for God is not where we should go. That is not God's attention. God's uh, real purpose is why he wants us to go there. Our motivation and our purpose. We might live the same way that we've been living after hearing God's word, but God expects our motivation, our purpose of doing the things that we're doing to be changed. And that's what happened to Abram. His daily life was the same. He was still a nomad. He was still raising sheep and cattle. <coughs> and and uh, he knew that he had to go to the land of Canaan. And, but the motivation was different. He knew that God would bless him. He believed that. And so, when he arrived in Canaan, God acknowledged that decision. God blessed that decision, and that land became a holy land. That land became the land of blessing. When we think of the New Testament, and uh, a, uh, one of the most prominent figures in the New Testament who wrote 13 books of the New Testament Bible, we think of Paul. I wonder what your image of Paul is. What, is, what was his occupation what, was his, what did his career look like? You might say, oh, he was the great missionary who uh, went over all over uh, Rome and uh, he set up all these churches as a church planter. Maybe you think of IMB missionaries or um, you know, the NAM missionaries, inland missionaries uh, who give a full-time career to God's work. But the observer of Paul, Luke in particular, uh, Luke, who is the author of Acts, observes, he's following Paul and observes his life and gives a very different picture of what you and I might think of Paul's life. Because in, in Luke's eyes, Paul was, had a secular job. He had a daily life. And he served God 
on the side, it looked like. I'm not kidding you. Uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 3 and 4 is an account of Luke and how he observed, what he observed of Paul. Let me read this first for us. And because he, this is Paul, he was the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For they were tent makers by trade, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greek. So in Luke's eyes, Paul was the tent maker. If he were, to live, he were living today, he would probably work for like Coleman, right? Making tents, building tents and selling them. And during the week, Monday to like uh, Friday, he would work making tents and he would talk to people. But on uh, the Sabbath day, which was Saturday back then, he would go to the Jewish synagogues and preach God's word, explain who Jesus Christ is. And uh, he was a tent maker uh, and in his daily life, and he was doing God's work on, so to speak, Sunday. I see some of our gospel life teachers here, and uh, you know, you, during the week you're working, and on Sunday you're coming and, uh, and teaching people the word of God. And that, that's what Paul's life usually was. And uh, this was in the city of Corinth, but not only in Corinth, we find uh, he doing this every, everywhere he goes. The first city in Europe, as he entered Europe, was the city of Philippi, remember? And the first convert to Christianity was Lydia. What was Lydia's occupation, if you remember from your Bible? She was a seller of purple cloth. She was a cloth seller, clothes seller. So Paul happened to be, happened to be the uh, tent maker, similar occupation, they talked to each other during the week, and she trusted and accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord. She became the first convert of uh, Europe. Many times uh, in our lives, when God wants us to obey, He wants us to obey in our daily mundane tasks. It happens in our daily lives. Sometimes in extraordinary cases, God calls you to mission field, to let go of everything and to move on to something that a specific plan that God has for you. Maybe that time can come for you. But most, mostly, God leads us in our daily, everyday life. He speaks to us. He expects us to obey Him in the things that we are doing every day. In your office desks, at your schools, at your research labs. At the companies that you're working, God expects you to obey Him in specific ways. But you might think, what should I, how should I obey? The Bible is never specific on how we should obey. Again, the Bible is always expecting us to uh, obey with the right motivation to do God's will. If you have the obedient heart, God, I, I read this this morning, and I want to obey this somehow. If you have the obedient heart, God will honor that and show you during the day, just like God showed Abram. Because Jesus says about himself, he didn't say, I am the you know, know-how, I am not the model for your life. He didn't say that. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus directs our path each day uh, at your workplace, in da your daily lives. As long as we have that hearts to obey God. As we have that motivation to follow after what God says in our lives, Jesus leads us in your very specific daily lives. How can we be, have blessing follow in our lives? First of all, we need to obey Him in daily life. Obey Him in daily life. As we read the word. Secondly, we can experience His blessing in our life by worshiping Him in daily life. Can we say this together? Worship Him in daily life. Let's look at the response of um, Abram in the latter part of the story, verse 7 to 9. The, the secret to Abram's life of blessing was worship. Verse 7. <laughs> let's go to verse 7. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. God confirmed his decision to stay in the land of Canaan. And he says, I will bless you and your descendants. And when Abram had that encounter with God, he uh, worshipped God. He built an altar to God. 
This was very intentional. Let's look at the next verse as well. And he also moved around in that land, east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, tent once again. And then he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord, called upon him who has called Abram. It was a beautiful worship time, personal worship time to the Lord that was blessing him. We need to note that Abram worshipped God where he was. He didn't come to church. He didn't build a church to regularly go to this church to you know, worship God. We want to notice that he worshipped where God had blessed him. Where did God bless you at right now? Where are you winning your bread for daily life? Where are you enjoying your life with your family? Where are you enjoying with your social, in your social life? God has blessed you in that way. And in that place, Abraham built an altar. In that place, he called upon the name of the Lord. Those people who, whose uh, life blessing follows are those who worship God in daily life, where you are right now. Of course, the place of blessing is the church, worship service, and Christian fellowship. But that only happens once a week. But God blesses us every day, and to receive that blessing, we can worship God wherever you are, wherever God has set your foot on, your Canaan, so to speak. And when we make that place our place of worship, God's blessing always follows. I want to share with you a personal testimony. When I was in Texas, uh, uh, you know, I remember the time when I was admitted to the school where I was got to the, my terminal degree, and uh, uh, this was Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, I was, uh, you know, just uh, very emotionally excited because this was the same school that my dad studied at. And after the admission, you know, all the or orientation and introduction, all that was done, they, uh, t they said, to go to the library. And so I did. And uh, there the librarian showed me this, this cubicle that I was supposed to use for the rest of my um, program here. And, uh, you know, it was a way of honoring uh, students, saying that you could use this space, personal space, to keep your books. Uh, since it's in the library, there's no due date for the books that you, you don't have to check it out, right? It's just there. So you could, you know, uh, have this all extended time of using the books, and uh, you could study there. And it was a flashback to something. When I sat there in my small cubicle with my door shut, it was a flashback to when my dad was one, in one of these cubicles. Remember as a little kid that uh, he would take me to his cubicle and I recall this, this is just a desk and a small chair but all around the desk and chair was, were, were books piled up, stacked up high off to the ceiling. That was the image I had. And all these papers lying around everywhere in the small room. It was, you know, uh, my, my dad's bat cave, <laughs> so to speak, his man cave. You know, he studied and everybody was so quiet and solemn studying and serious research and my cubic was empty but at that time but what I imagined wow God has uh, blessed me so much I'm so honored to be at the same place that my dad was and the first thing that uh, I wanted to do with all my heart was worship God at that place I knew there would be many you know times of tears and research and sweat at this place but this first moment when I'm here I wanted to worship God for leading me so far. And so I worshiped him, I prayed to him, thanking him, and also pray for God's blessing to be upon this place. This became my small worship sanctuary, my worship center. And this was the place I built my altar and called upon the name of the Lord. I, I remind myself of this passage in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. Let's read this verse, chapter 2, verse 2, actually. Let's read this verse together, shall we? It's on the screen, hopefully. Okay, let's read it together. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mount of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. It shall come to the pass in the latter days. When in the latter days? Latter days are the end of days when Jesus, after Jesus has come, right now. Anytime Jesus can come back. We are living in the latter, the end days, the last days. And it says, and Isaiah prophesies that in the latter days, last days, the mount of the Lord, house of the Lord, shall be established 
as the highest mountains. Imagine your workplaces as mountains. Different areas of, of society, different areas of life. You're all successful. You're all working and you're you know, diligent on your mountain uh, in the world, in your area. But God says in the last day, one mountain, God's mountain, holy temple of God, will, uh, will be exalted over all these other mountains. And I envision all of us, you at your workplaces, you at your schools, you at your research, you at your home, wherever you might be, on your mountain, that you would make that place a temple of God. We don't bring in, we don't have to pursue after blessing. When we make your place, the place that God has called you, a temple of God, when you make that a place, a worship center, and exalt Him, blessings follow and God will exalt your life and your ministry. What is worship? What is worshiping God? Worshiping God is very simple. It is remembering Him. Do you remember God on Monday morning when you're busy checking your emails and you know, having all these meetings? Do you remember God? Worship is remembering God. Remembering that He has led you so far. Remembering that He is the one who could take care of your problems. He is the one that is the solution to all your your questions. Remembering God is what worship is. We recall in Abram's life that whenever he was right with God, he worshiped God. He, wor he built all these altars all over the place of Canaan. But when he was cheating against God, like when he was, had Ishmael through Hagar, when he uh, deceived people around him saying, this Sarah is not my wife, she's my sister to save his own skin. He did not worship God. He did not build an altar there. He did not call on the name of the Lord. But when he called on the name of the Lord, when he remembered God, when he built an altar in those places, Abram's life was saved and successful and in fact became the fount of blessing for others as well. Brothers and sisters, if bless, you want blessing to follow your life this year, if you want to be successful this year, worship God wherever you are right now. Not in the future when I'm done with the career, I'm going to be a missionary, I'm going to do so much work for God. No, not then. Yes, do it then too, but right now, God has led you to your land of Canaan. There not not, not be much right now, but God has blessed you in the land of Canaan. And when we worship God in our daily life, when we listen to God in our daily life, Blessing will follow as we follow God's plan for our lives. Worship Him in daily life. What does it mean to be a worshiper in daily life? To be a worshiper means that you are committed to worshiping, right? You are committed. You are determined to worship. That's what a worshiper is. Uh, imagine a student, you know. Does a student, uh, like on Monday morning on, or Tuesday morning, because this is... Uh, you know, long weekend, uh, does, that, does he or she say in, in her, his or her heart, you know, I'm so on fire to learn, I want to achieve, and I want to thrive, and I want to advance academics, and, you know, do something good for society. Are you always, like, so excited to go to school every day? If you are, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Maybe you are motivated when you first enter the school, but every day it's a commitment. You pay the tuition, you, have, you want to graduate, so you make it your job, your obligation to go to school. And that's how we all finish school, I hope. If you're a worshiper, you are committed to worship. Sometimes you don't want to worship. Sometimes you don't feel like God is there. Sometimes you have this grumbling, God, complaint. God, what, what do you want me to obey? Like Abraham, you're confused. But when, when you say you're committed to worship and you're a worshiper, it means regardless of your condition of your heart, regardless of the situation of, of life, you are worshiping God and you are remembering Him, what He has done for you and what He has promised you. And when we realize what God is doing in our lives and we continue to worship, that place will be your sanctuary. That place will be your place of God's blessing. That was Abram's life. Abraham, Abram experienced God's blessing because, not because he had figured it all out and he was living the life. He was the father blessing to all the nations. He did not even see it. But he experienced God's blessing every day as he listened, obeyed God's word. He also felt the presence of God every day in the nothingness Canaan as he worshipped God, as he remembered the name of the Lord. 
I pray, my brothers and sisters, that we, you and I, all of us, would experience blessing following our lives because we worship God where we are. Amen? Let's experience Him, not because everything is fine and dandy, but because we remember Him, and this place is where God has put us. He has called us to this place in our homes, in our workplaces, in our church. And as we acknowledge and honor God for that, God, you are the fount of blessing. You are the one who called me here. And I worship you. I remember you. When we do that, God will protect your life. God will uh, bless your life. And God will reproduce many fruits in your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray to our Lord.